Hello everyone, I'm Gareth Dennis. I'm a railway engineer, I'm a writer in railway and transport matters, and uh, unlike Chris Packham, I'm an environmentalist. Uh, Chris, dear Chris here, has done a video, uh, did a video yesterday as part of his ongoing vanity court case um, to throw out HS2, uh, despite the fact that, uh, stop HS2, despite the fact that HS2 is being built as we speak. Um, and I thought I'd pick it apart because it's just full of nonsense. Uh, it really is, it's dreadful. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and keep this as short as possible. So let's get cracking. Let's see what Packham has to say. Ahead of our court case, I thought it might be useful for us to run through 10 reasons why HS2 is appalling, unnecessary and already redundant. We're off to a great start, as you can see. Um, down here, where is it? Down, down here, this, 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 this corner here is going to be uh, a little um, counter for how much uh, nonsense we've got. And already it's, it's digging away. The buzzer's going to be working overtime, I think. Anyway, what else has he got to say? This is all rubbish, by the way, obviously. You know, it's over, it's over here, this, this here. Never mind. I've tried to stick to areas of my own expertise. Spoiler alert, he hasn't. Here we go. Number one. We're in a climate emergency. And the UK government's goal is to reach net zero emissions by 2050. That's less than 30 years. HS2's own figures, though, show it won't be carbon neutral until well into the next century. OK, this is nonsense. This is a claim that has been repeated by Stop HS2 for a long time, and it's based on a complete misreading of numbers um, and a misunderstanding of the way that carbon analysis works for projects um, according to the government's guidelines. Uh, this is looking at the project in isolation. It's not uh, looking at the bigger picture, the bigger policy picture. If HS2 exists within a policy bubble, um, we'll have bigger fish to fry, frankly. Um, it is, th this, this, whole, th this whole carbon neutrality thing is nonsense. It's looking only at HS2, not looking at the, the, the HS2's main benefits, which are on the existing railway network. What else has he got to say? Number two. Oh, okay. Well, on carbon alone, let's just have a little think. So the reality is that the whole carbon lifespan of HS2, including its uh, operational uh, carbon costs and its construction carbon costs, uh, all of that comes to less than around about one month's UK road transport emissions. So that should give you an idea of scale. So the carbon emissions thing, just forget about it. It's nonsense. It's more of a plane than a train. HS2's rhetoric of getting people out of cars and planes and onto trains simply doesn't wash when a primary reason for building HS2 is to enable large-scale airport expansion. No, it is not. Oh, where to start? Firstly, HS2's main benefit is in driving modal shift onto the railways away from air and road. How does it achieve that? Well. Um, Britain's railways are a kind of a jack of all trades and a master of none. You've got a huge mixture of different service patterns, trains, speeds, stopping patterns, all these things. Uh, and at the moment, the, the trains that kill capacity most effectively are the fast ones, the ones that don't stop anywhere, the ones that go non-stop from, say, I don't know, York to London or um, Birmingham to Manchester. The reason for that is because they force everything else to get out of the way. So in order that they don't catch up with the trains that are stopping at intermediate stations, Essentially, you're getting rid of those where you would have stops at intermediate stations. You essentially have to leave a load of empty space on your railway so that the fast train going 125 miles an hour doesn't catch up with the stopping train. By getting those fast trains and putting them on their own lines, you free up a huge amount of space for more trains on the existing railway network. That's the whole point. That is the whole point. Now, part of, uh, you know, we have to have a transition. We can't switch off airlines overnight. We can't do that. What we can do is reduce the, or indeed get rid of, the amount of domestic aviation in the UK. That's flying between airports in the UK to make connections. If you can have, air, if, if you have uh, an airport connected high speed line, it means you don't need to uh, have your flight from Leeds down to Heathrow and then away you go. You can get the train, which reducing flights, which are hugely environmentally damaging, huge carbon cost, is a good thing. This is a good thing. Um, so the idea that you wouldn't utilise a high-speed rail line to get rid of those domestic flights is farcical. There are 170 flights a day between London, between the various London airports and the various central belt airports in Scotland. That's ridiculous. Not to mention the number of flights to Birmingham, to Manchester, to Leeds from London. All of those shouldn't exist anymore. None of them should exist. If it means that you're slightly inconvenienced, what a shame. We have, this is a climate emergency we're in. All of them shouldn't exist. HS2 is the way to enable that that most likely can't happen at Heathrow. 
conspiratorial nonsense. Number three, we're in an ecological emergency. And yet HS2 will destroy almost 700 wildlife sites, including well over 100 ancient woodlands and 33 sites of special scientific interest. All of those figures are fictional. They are made up. They are the worst case possible scenario based on a methodology that no one has ever used before and is desi was designed to make it look as bad as possible by the Woodland Trust, the Wildlife Trusts, and the RSPB. Their Rethink HS2 report. If you look into the text of that report itself, it says itself very clearly, this is a worst case scenario. The, the idea that somehow that goes from a report uh, making it sound as bad as it can be so that they can get drive, kind of justify the amount of their members' money that they're wasting on this stupid campaign, uh, to go from that, that, you know, destroying all this stuff, to the reality, which is where HS2, for example, in HM Woodland, uh, is impacting on uh, less than one ten thousandth of the U ten thousandth of the UK's ancient woodland. Uh, not to mention the fact that uh, you know the the you know, you've got the the impact on uh, all of the various other habitats. It's, it's far less than the road programs that are currently planned. Risk two, the the road investment strategy number two. Uh, several major projects that are ongoing on that. Uh, one of them uh, happens to be uh, in the lower reaches of a well-known southeastern uh, river. Uh, and it crosses it, uh, is 14 miles long and has as much impact on ancient woodland as HS2 does on its 345 miles. Just, uh, again, this is just, uh, the idea of the destruction is just wildly overblown. Um, and unfortunately, it's playing into the hands of the fossil fuel lobby because they're all for it. it means more people drive. Number four, endangered species. Let's just name a few. Willow tit. Black hair streak, dingy skipper butterflies, the Bechstein's bat, the white clawed crayfish, hedgehogs, barn owls, and countless others. You just named a lot of wildlife there. What's he going to say about them all? I'm sure it'll be a well evidenced, uh, you know, thesis of uh, proposed problems that HS2 causes. That will be displaced or destroyed by this project. Oh, that's it. No, that's it. He just says they're going to be displaced or destroyed without any evidence. Uh, okay, great. Total nonsense. Number five, water. HS2's construction is set to drain huge quantities of water. Their tunnel boring work is predicted to need between six and 10 million litres a day. Is that a lot? Is that not a lot? How much does that compare to anything? As it happens, that's not actually a particularly spectacular amount. It's a lot of water, but you know, when you just quote a big number like that, you're not operating in good faith. It looks like you're trying to scare people. An aquifer supplying a large quantity of London drinking water is at risk. And rare chalk streams with their unique and intricate ecosystems are all set to be lost. If anyone mentions the water supply and the chalk aquifer stuff to you, you know that they're a charlatan. It is total gibberish, utter nonsense. It's just conspiratorial quackery. The, uh, those aquifers, that, that geology, the chalk geology in and around London, is probably amongst the best known geology in the world. We have been tunneling through it for centuries. Channel Tunnel, HS1, various railways, various roads. We know that, it, that that bit of ground has been more surveyed than any other in the world. It's just remarkable to suggest that Walton would be absolutely turning in his grave. We wouldn't be building a railway if we weren't confident that we were going to not cause like that we were going to not going to cause these problems. The, the idea that you'd build a railway in the knowledge that you're going to wreck London's water supply is just for the bur it's not it's crazy, absolutely crazy and unfounded. Number six, tearing open the countryside. HS2 quite literally paves the way for infrastructure development of the very worst kind. What does that mean? What what does he mean by that? What, sounds scary. What what does he mean? It can't even meet its own promise of no net loss of biodiversity, and it's already pro Why not? The project's only just started being built. Uh, why can't it meet? Uh, uh, you know, why can't it meet that target? And we need to be holding the project to account to make sure it does meet that target. Proven they aren't capable of planting a tree when hundreds of thousands of those they've already planted have died. <sighs> not going to do an impersonation of Chris Packham here. He looks pretty smug here, doesn't he? He thinks this is a great gotcha. Uh, the part of England where these trees have been planted has just suffered a substantial drought. One of the hottest summers, the hottest summer on record. Um, 
And a lot of the trees died because there was no way of, there was nothing else they could do. The, the calculation was made. Unfortunately, we, you know, we have a government that knows the cost of everything and the value of nothing. If you've got a decision between spend more money to go out and you know, f uh, tend to the trees that have really suffered in the drought or spend less money and plant new trees, unfortunately, government is going to go for plant more trees. All the trees that have died have been replanted. Um, th this is not a gotcha. This is not the great gotcha that Chris Packham thinks it is. Um, no, not at all. Number seven. Rolling Vast seven. sums of taxpayers' oh, money, taxpayers money is being used to destroy nature. No, it isn't. This is not how economics works. This is not how borrowing for infrastructure works. Uh, there's not a slice of my, you know, my PAYE that gets taken away and used and has HS2 written on it. That's just nonsense. Uh, this is money that we borrow against future returns in, in growth by you know, providing not only by providing a new piece of valuable infrastructure, but also in, in training new people that then can get better jobs afterwards and then they go on to earn more, they earn more tax, so on. Employing other people, they pay tax, the, 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 you know, that, that money, they, re, they spend their money as well. All these things, you know, the, all this money that, that gets created out of, government is a wealth creator. You know, it's, we create wealth by investing in these major infrastructure schemes and by them being sustainable transport infrastructure rather than, I don't know, 4,000 miles of new road that Rishi Sunak was talking about the other week. Um, we, have, we can have sustainable growth whilst creating all these new jobs. We can move people away from the coal industry, away from, uh, away from uh, the aeronautical industry, away from these industries that are the past, frankly, and into new, uh, new industries, new green industries. Building railways is certainly one of those. Already massively over budget. No, it isn't. Budget has yet been properly set. At well over a hundred billion. No, it isn't well over a hundred billion. HS2 is the most expensive job creation scheme in history. <laughs> the, what? How many billions were spent even back in the 50s on, on, on the New Deal in America? What, what, you can't just make stuff up like that. What does he mean, the most expensive job creation thing? It's just made up. It's just nonsense. Any of its executives earning six-figure salaries? Six-figure salaries. I mean, there are some pretty well-paid people in HS2 because it's a big government organisation and that's kind of how it works. Um, you have to meet that. That's just the way that salaries work. But saying six-figure salary, 100,000, it's a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. and I would love to be paid that much. But um, that kind of covers a lot of people. Civil servants get paid a reason why because they're responsible for a lot of stuff. Anyway, that is true. It's not a porky. There are several people in HS2 earning six-figure salaries. When Boris recently announced an additional five billion to build, 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 five billion, he neglected to mention the 100 plus billion being spent on HS2. It's because Dominic Cummings hates the project and doesn't want it to be mentioned. It's, it's, not, it's no great conspiracy. Number eight, HS2 is already obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dearie me. HS2, when it opens, unless another one snaps in behind it, will be the most modern um, uh, railway in the world, operating in the world. Uh, not just the infrastructure, but the, the way it's operated, the way it'll be integrated into the surrounding transport systems. Uh, it's going to be an incredible piece of infrastructure. It's exciting. We should be excited. This is the future of sustainable transport, and the, the spine of that is HS2. Um, the idea that it's already obsolete is farcical. Let's see where he goes with this. HS2's latest business case. Straight for the business case. How inspirational. This doesn't take into consideration the effects. Effects. COVID-19. Business users are key to HS2. Nope. No, they're not. As I've already said, the biggest benefit of HS2 is on the existing railway network for local passengers, for, uh, for commuters. What, what, what's the, how are, even if you got, hop onto you know, LNER trains, or pre-COVID anyway, hop onto LNER trains, and uh, how many people are business people traveling? On? It's, it's holiday makers and people kind of just students going around. It's just the, the idea that it's some elitist railway is, is a fiction, again, created by uh, the IEA and the TPA and, and latched onto by Stop HS2 and unfortunately then grabbed by the green, by the, these so-called environmentalists, but really they're just conservationists. They're not very good ones of those either. And this market has now all but disappeared. COVID is a blip. It, it's, this is a short-term blip. The, uh, 
Mark on uh, on the Twitter shared a fantastic graph showing the the drop from COVID. So you kind of a little drop is like, oh, this is torrential, and then they're zooming out on the graph, and this huge kind of climbing, kind of rising, and then a little dip from COVID, and then it continues to rise. The idea that you know we've needed this new infrastructure for decades. The idea that COVID is going to the mega trend is climate change. The mega trend is 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 the climate catastrophe, and we need to move people off roads out of the air. HS2 is the greatest enabler of that, that we can do as a project, as a single project right now. The idea that the market's disappeared is nonsense. Uh, oh yeah, two other things. More flexible working has only resulted in more people traveling long distance. So that we've had a reduction in season ticket sales uh, over the last sort of 10 years really, certainly the last five years. This has resulted in more people traveling long distance. We've had an increase, a huge increase, doubling and tripling of long distance travelers. Um, the other point is to do with people often cite you know digital communications, video conferencing, all this stuff is going to get rid of the you know the the, the traveling you know, the, the transport market. Nope. All the, the the correlation is very much that as you increase the amount of people communicate communicate with each other, you increase the opportunities for people to to do business. You increase people's friends pool. People travel have friends further afield, so they travel more to see them. This technology increases the amount of travel, and in terms of people working from home from COVID. Again, this is a short-term trend. We're trapped here. I'm, I'm working from home. I'm trapped here. I hate it. It's horrible. It's awful for my mental health. A lot of people uh, are in the same boat. Um, it's a you know it's a capitalist's dream to to get rid of all their overheads and have people trapped in their homes working. You know, essentially everyone getting a pay cut and these companies can just get rid of a load of offices. It's, it's perfection for them. Um, not only that, but also only about one in four people, you know, the maximum is one in four people who can actually work from home. Most jobs are geographically specific. They, you have to be somewhere to do that job. Um, before uh, COVID, the amount of people who are working from home was around about 5%. Doubling that is only 10%. You know, this is not some radical shift. The idea that this, you know, everyone is gagging to get out and do things and live their lives. The idea that this is going to, there might be a few things we've learned, and there's certainly we've got a huge, inter interesting body of scientific data to understand what the what what the the impact is from from this lockdown. Uh, frankly, trivial on emissions. Sadly, uh, it just shows how much more we need to do. But anyway, the idea that it's anything other than a short-term trend that's going to normalise immediately again is 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 silly. It's just picking something as a as an idea as a theme to oppose HS2 without any real science behind it. HS2 is obsolete before it's even really started. A far smarter investment oh, at this go. time would be super high-speed broadband for all. Have fun sending your mum down broadband, uh, or indeed, you know, your shopping or anything down broadband. Uh, and also, this buys into this neoliberal George Osborne uh, nonsense economics of th there's there's this choice, kind of either or choice. No, no, you can do both. Have some you know, have some imagination, people. Number nine. It's taking us in the wrong direction. You see, now more than ever, people need... It's not taking us in the wrong direction. It's taking us from Birmingham down to London and up to Manchester and Leeds. Pretty good. More effective local transport solutions. As life has relocalised in the face of the pandemic risk, we... Right, so localism. HS2 is a local transport revolution. By, innate, by getting rid of all those long distance services, you, you create networks that can be self-contained, that can actually deliver the transport that local people need, that, that city, um, that both rural and urban communities and, and suburban communities need to function, rather than having to, you know, basically being entirely at the whimsy of the fast trains passing through, uh, not stopping anywhere. You, know, you stand at Adderley Park or, you know, Leighton Buzzard or Retford or, um, you know, any of these, you know, Wellingborough and see how many trains pass through without stopping. HS2 is about taking those trains that don't stop and freeing up space to allow many, every train to stop at all these stations. So you get a quantum leap in service provision in, in, in you know, seats per hour, basically. The reason that transport outside the M25 doesn't work very well is because we have, you, in, in London, you turn up and, the tra and you don't care about the timetable because the train just appears out of thin, you know, it just appears and you hop on it and you don't have to worry about the connection time. HS2 is about enabling that to happen outside of the M25. It's not, it's not the be-all and end-all. There are other things that need to happen, but it's a key enabler to double or even triple the capacity of the existing railway network for passengers, let alone freight. Need to improve and upgrade the transport systems we already have. That key point being that HS2 is an upgrade to the existing railway network. In fact, it's a, it's a mainline upgrade of the West Coast mainline, the Midland mainline, and the East Coast mainline, as well as the cross-country route and various interconnectors that go into the major hub stations. It's just a fantastic upgrade of our existing network. 
so they're fit to meet the urgent needs of the climate and ecological emergency. So any just who does, mate. When we can move forwards into a more sustainable and healthier future for everyone. Number 10. HS2 is severing our connections to the land. What does he mean by that? The human tragedy of HS2 simply cannot be escaped. So many families have been evicted, torn from their homes, generations uprooted, tens of thousands... It's a really nice house, isn't it? ...tens of bodies have been exhumed from the ground. That happens when you build a major infrastructure project in the middle of a city. There are bodies everywhere in cities. Crossrail did the same thing. You don't see Packham getting upset about that. Communities have been destroyed. Where? Show me one community that has been destroyed by HS2. One. And in many cases, HS2 haven't even paid for their land grabs. If that's the case, then there are things that need to be done to fix that. But um, it's not any great conspiracy. It's probably administrative nonsense and bureaucracy getting in the way of things. And it's certainly not reason to stop the project. They've been cheating the property owners. Number right, before we get on to number 11, which I'm pretty sure comes after 10, but anyway, um, let's talk about impacts on livelihood, shall we? Uh, last year, between 25 and 30,000 people were killed or severely injured uh, on Britain's roads. 30 to 40,000 people in the UK were uh, died uh, prematurely as a result of poor air quality from pollution, uh, not just not just from emissions, but from you know break uh, dust and all and knocks and all these nasties. Um, mostly from HGVs on the road, but also from cars, uh, and that's you know that's that's lives being ter that's lives being cut short or heavily impacted physically, that doesn't touch on the mental anguish from the stress of, of having to drive or being near a busy road, you know, noise, vibration, damage to property, damage to roads, damage to bridges that local, local authorities have to spend that money, uh, you know, which in turn has disruption. Um, the fact that people can't cycle because there are so many cars on the road, uh, people don't feel comfortable walking around because there's so many cars on the road, you know, businesses suffer as a result of that, businesses are impacted by traffic congestion. Um, not to mention the fact that then you've got people who aren't comfortable cycling, uh, therefore uh, you know, less, we're less healthy as a country, so the NHS has to spend more looking after us. It's just a huge knock-on effect of, of, of road, road use in this country. Our fixation with roads is just a catastrophic personal effect on people's livelihoods. So a few people along the, li the line of the route being impacted, you've, they've been compensated where they haven't been, bureaucracy's got in the way, that needs to be looked into, but I'm sorry, it doesn't compare to the number who are impacted by roads in this country. Let's see what number 11 comes up with. Number 11, yep, a bonus one. Destroying democracy. And HS2 is a classic case of top-down democracy. Okay, right. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we live in a parliamentary democracy. That is kind of how, that's how democracy works in this country. It is top-down. Oh, it'd be great to have, I'm all for more localism. I'm all for, all for councils and regional uh, government having more you know, devolved power. But as it stands, central government is in charge. So, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know what democracy Chris thinks he's living in where central government decides it knows best and local voices are completely ignored. That's also not true. The number of changes to HS2 to account for local people, uh, local MPs, local pressure groups, is huge, huge change list. And, um, you know, all the tunnel that was added, you know, tweaks the alignment to dodge this and that. The idea that it's sat unchanged carving through everything is just farcical. Projects like HS2 set a dangerous precedent for development and democracy going forward leaving our countryside wide open to rampant development. Uh, what now? What, 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 what? Open to rampant development? What, how, what? what? What evidence do you have for this? What development? What on earth do you mean? You can't just make stuff up to scare people, to get, to get them behind your cause. Nasty piece of work. Let's be very clear. HS2 is destroying no, isn't. some of our most beautiful, ancient, and valuable habitat. In an age where we're tearing down statues, we mustn't forget that they're out there tearing down beautiful old oak trees. That doesn't even work. That doesn't even work as a gag or a line. What do you mean? Why are you dragging BLM into this? This one. I presume that's in his garden. Pretty nice garden. Um, 
Here he is, with, it's time to stop HS2 there. Let's not take lectures from Chris Packham, who until very recently, uh, indeed may well still be, I don't know, he hasn't told us, uh, was under the payroll of Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, he was on some podcasts and did some advertising for them. And uh, also uh, was advertising for the airline industry to do sort of wildlife tourism flights to all corners of the globe. Let's not take any lectures on environmentalism from Chris Packham, eh? It's time to stop HS2. No, it isn't. Oh, also, it's not too late. It is already, the project's well underway. You know, it's being built. The, the, the TBM, the, you know, the tunnel boring machines are being constructed and the viaducts are starting to be erected. It's, it's happening now. Oh, it's too late. It's time to think of a more sustainable, harmonious and healthy future. With HS2 in it, please. And for the future of our planet's environment. Yes, right, okay, for a hundred... Oh, no. Not this Pratt, not this nasty pseudo right-wing Pratt. Billion pounds you could increase capacity and modernise the entire existing British Rail network top to bottom, from Inverness to the Channel Tunnel. Yes, that's HS2, that's what HS2 does, Jonathan Pye. A rail network that is the envy of the world that encourages people out of their cars and down from the skies and... Yep, that's, uh, he is describing HS2, this... Unfunny Pratt is just literally describing HS2. Um, there is no... The implication is that you could spend that money on the existing network. No, you couldn't. You'd be spending twice or double that amount to get what you do get with HS2, just upgrading the existing railway network. Um, not to mention the fact that it would be far more disruptive and damaging in terms of properties and habitats. All that stuff that's built up right against our existing railway network, you need to you know, add extra lines, dual, kind of uh, grade separate all the junctions, just an inordinate amount of disruption. It would take far longer. Network Rail have laughed the idea out of town. It's just, it's based in, an, in a position of ignorance to say that. Uh, just like this uh, spiked online nasty piece of work. That there are delays after oh, for f sake. Well, that was dismal, wasn't it? Anyway, uh, while we've got this weird black kind of uh, thing in the, in the corner, let's, let's uh, get it going in the background while I moan a bit. Where, where, I mean, I counted, what, in excess of 40 porkies through that. Uh, it's just... Packham has created a, a little vanity project of his own, and the dangerous thing here is that he's managing to twist it in such a way that a lot of the, the so-called environmentalists and real environmentalists who are supporting him are essentially coming out against rail. They're coming out loudly and turning and changing the kind of the, dis the discussion to sound to make it sound like railways are uh, are a, a negative thing environmentally this is really dangerous we need to nip this in the bud i'm hoping very much that the court case uh, gets thrown out in the most um savage and embarrassing way possible for chris because maybe it'll make him stop uh although i doubt it will he seems to be fixated on this thing um I've tried, uh, I'd, I've tried reaching out to him to have a discussion offline, out of the public eye, to sort of say, look, OK, you can have your campaign, but let's stop repeating some of the lies. Let, let's, let's have it based on good faith. Let's have a discussion based on good faith. You know, there are plenty of things that HS2 needs to do better. Um, but that, all those suggestions are getting drowned out by people screaming blue murder, making up stuff about people throwing animals in shredders and all this nonsense. Um, Let's have a discussion based on evidence and truth and not this kind of fictitious nonsense. Anyway, uh, that's quite enough from me. Uh, I, uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, great. If you thought it was awful and I'm a dreadful person and I want to, the planet to burn, then I can't help you. Um, if you want to find out more about HS2, then look up anything I've tweeted uh, uh, with the hashtag, uh, hashtag YHS2. Um, in the meantime, uh, go and read. Go, if, if, you, if you're in the Green Party or you support the cause of the Green Party in England and Wales, the Look up Greens for HS2, run by a load of Green Party people about why HS2 is a really good idea. Um, and that's all from me, really. Cheerio.